Okay, so I think we can begin. Just make sure this is placed at an angle so everybody can see us at home. Uh, welcome everybody. Hello. Welcome everybody to uh, welcome everybody to the very first live Friday lecture uh, of the Center for Islamic and Middle East Studies in the era of Corona. Um, this is a bit experimental. We've never done it this way before, where we have uh, some of you present here in the auditorium, and then we have quite a few of you watching this live on Zoom uh, at home. Hello to you. Um, it's a little bit different also because normally, uh, of course, we would have, uh, have some coffee and pastries here for you to have while you mingle after the event. We don't have that because in this new era, mingling is highly irresponsible, right? Um, but I see most of you here have already internalized the, uh, the new routines. I saw a lot of you disinfecting your hands when you came in here. You're sitting at, at one meter distance to each other. All that is great. If you people at home, you do whatever you want. Um, today, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Lars Gule. He's an associate professor at uh, Oslo Met uh, University here in Oslo. And he will be uh, giving us a brief of his recent research in um, the adventures, the adventures, the experiences of uh, foreign fighters. So the journey of the foreign fighter. Um, he's going to be speaking for roughly 40, 45 minutes. Um, if any of you have questions, uh, I suggest you write them up, uh, remember them, and you can pose them after the lecture. Those of you at home could also perhaps write them in the, uh, the chat, and uh, we'll try to go over as many as possible of those questions after the lecture. So uh, with that, I'll give the uh, microphone to uh, Lars Gula. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I am happy to be able to give this uh, lecture here. Um, I should say that it is not a theoretical analytical lecture. This is rather descriptive. And uh, I will in a moment uh, say something about my, sor my sources and the background for uh, this lecture that I've called The Journey of the Foreign Fighter. First, should we talk about foreign fighters or should we talk about Syria travelers? It depends on the definition. And I use this definition uh, developed by uh, Thomas Hegghammer in various contexts, uh, but I think this is a rather good uh, definition of a foreign fighter. A private individual who for ideologically, ideological or idealist reasons chooses to fight in armed conflicts outside his or her country, own country without financial gain as an important incentive, thus making a difference between a foreign fighter and a mercenary. However, a Syria traveler that we also talk about in this context of the conflict in Syria <clears throat> is a person who travels to Syria, one, in order to contribute to the struggle against the regime in Damascus, including in non-violent ways, and or because at a bit later stage than the origins of the conflict, they have a desire to settle in an Islamic state. Then we're talking about those who traveled to the caliphate. So <clears throat> a foreign fighter is a more narrow category than a Syrian traveler. There are more Syria travelers than there are foreign fighters, even though we tend to mix these categories or concepts. Proportionally, there are, not surprisingly, more women that are Syria travelers than the men. And proportionally, uh, most women actually uh, would fall in the category of uh, <coughs> Syria travelers and not uh, fighters. Briefly about the numbers. We're talking about tens of thousand foreign fighters and Syria travelers. Here, the statistics doesn't make a difference. They are including almost everyone. Uh, maybe about 40,000. It could be somewhat higher that have traveled to the Islamic State alone. Uh, <clears throat> so this is an incredibly huge number compared to other theaters of war where Islamists say they have been fighting jihad. Uh, so traveling to Syria and some also to Iraq, this has been a, a theater of war that has attracted an exceptional 
number of uh, foreign fighters. And they come from all over the world. I think it's more than 130 different countries, meaning not only Muslim majority countries, uh, <clears throat> and not necessarily all of them have been Muslims, but of course the great majority of those who have traveled have been Muslims. 10 to 12 percent of those who have traveled are women. We're talking about 4,000 to maybe 4,400 all in all, a again from all over the world. Total numbers from Europe, uncertain, but maybe between five and 6,000 have traveled and with the same proportion of, uh, of uh, women. So maybe 500 to 600 women <coughs> have traveled. From Norway, the Norwegian uh, <coughs> security police uh, estimates roughly 100. I'll come back to these numbers towards the end, including uh, 10, maybe 11 women. Briefly about my sources. It exists now a huge literature on the conflict in Syria, Islamic State, uh, the developments of uh, the, the conflict in Syria, uh, the various groups, etc., etc. So we do we do know a lot about what has been going on in the theater of war. We do know uh, also uh, a lot about what has happened in those areas controlled by the various uh, opposition militias uh, and groups, including what has been going on in the Islamic State. And we are getting more and more knowledge as researchers get access to the area and can talk to the people living there and they are telling about their experience. My particular and perhaps uh, original or unique sources are the trials against Norwegian foreign fighters. A number has returned, uh, seven or eight, a little bit dependent on how you count uh, as a foreign fighter from Norway, have been on trial in Norway. And uh, the uh, evidence presented include pictures, it includes uh, uh, their uh, social media communication with each other and with friends back home, uh, and of course their explanations in the, during the trials of what they have been doing. So this is the background. In addition, I went to Turkey earlier this year, February and March, before everyone had to return home, and uh, the purpose of that uh, trip was to interview Syrian refugees that had fled from uh, Islamic State controlled territories to find out about daily life in Islamic State territories. And I wanted to do that to check the stories of those who have been on trial. What were they telling? Was that reasonable? Was it truthful according to uh, other sources. Uh, and the point of all of this is uh, a book I'm writing about uh, Islamism in Norway and the for foreign fighter uh, phenomenon. So, what do we know about the motives of those who traveled? First of all, motives change over time. And uh, the first who left, they left when it became clear that the Arab Spring in Syria had turned into a civil war in 2012. And those who then traveled in the summer of 2012 emphasized that they have been traveling for humanitarian reasons. They wanted to contribute. And some of them went there, they did humanitarian work, some took up arms, they have returned and they have not been uh, on trial. So this is what they explained, how they, they the purpose of their travel. Uh, emphasizing also the fight against Bashar al-Assad's regime and its brutal oppression of the people of Syria. Then we have what we could call a middle period. And in this middle period, <coughs> the Islamic aspect becomes more pronounced. And then they 
are talking about the need to defend Muslims and Islam. And the order here is not irrelevant. Muslims, the people, and Islam. It was also a fight against Western imperialism and Western influences, and an anger against the West for not intervening, as had been done in Libya. Why not a no-fly zone? They are, the West is in reality on the side of Bashar al-Assad. Therefore, we are needed to fight. <clears throat> but then it clearly changes. And the numbers increases tremendously in the summer of 2014. And then it's a talk about defending Islam and Muslims. There is a change in the order here, an emphasis, change of emphasis. Many said they will support and contribute in building the Islamic State, the Caliphate. More and more emphasize the need to live in accordance with Sharia. As Muslims, they cannot live in a state not controlled by Islamic law. So, a number of those who are traveling are emphasizing that they are participating in a hijra from Jahiliya to Dar al-Islam. They are traveling, they are migrating from the land of ignorance, the land of oppression of Muslims and Islam to the abode of Islam. And for many, and, and this is this is a response to the appeal from the Islamic State, emphasizing the duty of every Muslim to do the hijra, to support the caliphate. <clears throat> so it, we can see from the sources, not necessarily the Norwegian foreign fighters. Some of them are talking about it, but it is not as pronounced amongst them as in uh, the international uh, literature uh, where researchers, journalists and researchers have talked to, they have stood on the border, so to speak, and talked to, why are you going to Syria? Why are you traveling to the Islamic State? Some research colleagues have also interviewed people in Raqqa and other places in Syria online, and they have heard these answers. And of course, they are on Facebook, and they are telling their friends, I am leaving because of this. And we have research colleagues who have studied this sort of communication. <clears throat> How did they prepare? Because they prepared, some prepared for a very long time. And here we're back to the Norwegians or those traveling from Norway. They started by emphasizing physical fitness, training. A lot of them, had been interested in martial arts before they thought of traveling to Syria. So for them, it was a continuation. But we have one example of one who even had an eye operation because he saw himself as a sniper when he came to Syria. So he had to correct his eyesight. They obtained equipment, suitable clothes. Some of them listened and asked people who were already in Syria, what do I need? Well, remember underwear, remember this, remember that. So suitable clothes and so-called combat vests, vests with lots of pockets where you can put magazines for your weapons and other applications you need in the field uh, were sought after and bought also in Norway. Sniper sites or telescope sites were bought online or in uh, weapon shops in uh, Norway before they packed their suitcases or backpacks. Some, especially again then, back to the first period, they also packed humanitarian aid, blankets, some foodstuffs, things like that. At least in one instance of those uh, have been on trial in Norway, that has been the case. You need money, even in Syria, even though some expected 
a salary from the militia they would join, including the Islamic State, uh, they were preparing to have money for travel and money for expenses in Syria. A lot of people were talking about buying their own guns. So therefore, they needed to have money with them. And how did they obtain money? Some went to the bank and got a loan with no intention of paying back. Some got new credit cards and withdrew all the money they could, again, without intention of paying back. Uh, <clears throat> so that was one way. Some were also lending money from, uh, or borrowing money from, uh, from friends. Uh, and when they did so, they could make it possible for those remaining to take over their own bank accounts and their accounts and communication with social services, NAV. So you would give someone access to your NAV account so you could send in the report card uh, every two weeks to have the money from NAV deposited on your account. And your friend could then withdraw it and send it to Syria. Or could take whatever he needed if you owed him money uh, you had borrowed from him for your travel. But this sort of fraudulent behavior was of course legitimized by it's okay to uh, cheat on the infidels, the kuffar. It's allowed. And they had fatwas uh, to show for it that they could do this. Of course, they needed to fix passports, visas, tickets, and uh, <laughs> they tried to get cheap tickets. Sometimes they forgot their reservation number, and we have a very interesting conversation between one of the helpers, one of the facilitators who was helping a guy to get a ticket, and they had forgotten the reference number, had to call the company, and they are sitting online on a phone tapped by the security police for half an hour waiting to get through, but they are talking a lot about what they are going to do, how he's going to travel, etc., etc. So we know a lot <laughs> about how they were thinking and planning because they were chatting while waiting on on the phone to get through to this uh, to this uh, airline to uh, to validate a ticket they needed to obtain contact information in the beginning the first who traveled they traveled and they could come to turkey especially if they went to hatay province uh, antakya they could there find contact persons and they would tell them go to this crossing and at night and get over the fence and you'll find Jabhat al-Nusra, you'll find Ahrar al-Sham, you will find this or that group there. Later on it became more uh, complicated and you would need contact persons. The Islamic State organized this uh, <clears throat> with contacts uh, that you could uh, get information, uh, especially phone numbers, to online. You could search the net and you could find the phone numbers to contact persons in Turkey that you would call and say, I am arriving, I need help to get into Syria. And we know this, that these numbers were easily available online because they were used by foreign fighters from all over the world. Norwegians use the same numbers that Australian foreign fighters used. <clears throat> and the Norwegian security police checked with their Australian colleagues and confirmed that, yes, this number we know because some of our citizens have used the same number when they traveled. The journey itself. Various ways of traveling, various routes. And again, this has changed over time. Again, one of the first, or some of the first, two of the early travelers in 2012, they bought a Volkswagen pickup, loaded it up with uh, humanitarian aid, and drove all the way to uh, Antakya in Turkey. Bought it here, dumped it there. They were checked on the way by uh, German police didn't find it suspicious, let them through, and they got through Turkey all the way to, uh, 
to the Hatay province on Takia, and then got across. And who did they join? Yeah, well, that is interesting because it's not quite clear. Zabat al-Nusra, Akhrar al-Sham, humanitarian work. One of them ended up in the Islamic State and was killed in the fight Kabane in 2015. We have examples of people who traveled to Beirut and then actually took the route through the mountains of Lebanon, walking across with the help of smugglers, arriving in the area, uh, an area at the time controlled by uh, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and other groups, not only Jabhat al-Nusra. Many travel by air to Turkey, landing in Istanbul, going on with internal flights, eventually by the recommendation of the Islamic State, travel by bus. And the reason is that if you travel by air, you're registered. The registration of passengers are much more strict on planes than any other means of transportation. Then a route, especially from Norway, became the uh, Greek route going by air to Greece and then by ferry from Greece to Turkey and then again, ideally by bus from the landing point to Istanbul. Some were tired and took planes anyway. In uh, Istanbul, they ended up in safe houses, especially those who had contact with and uh, were set on joining the Islamic State. So these safe houses were transit houses. People going to Syria were there, maybe for a few days. People coming from Syria, going home for various reasons were also there, so they met. And one of the Norwegian foreign fighters, or from Norway, he almost got cold feet there, because what he saw were the wounded, the maimed, those who had lost an arm, had lost an eye, and so on. Was this what he had bargained for? Was this what he was going to end up like? But since he was traveling with a friend, and that friend so already mentioned, the one who was later on killed, they went on. No, sorry, this was one who was following the friends who had traveled earlier on, and he wouldn't chicken out because he had someone already in Syria. From Istanbul, many traveled to Gaziantep and San Liurfa. Again, they would have to wait in safe houses. They would arrive, if you were traveling, if there were women who were going, they were allowed to travel by plane and they would need a guardian. So therefore some were allowed to travel with women uh, by air, internal air in Turkey to Gaziantep or Jan Liurfa, where they would be received. Others were encouraged to take a bus, but it's an overnight travel. It's quite a long, long distances in Turkey. So several would take planes, uh, also against the advice of, uh, of the Islamic State. But again, waiting in safe houses. And then the next step would be, uh, <clears throat> this is, this is uh, the, the travel to Turkey, uh, Greece to Istanbul, uh, also, uh, yes, you can see this. You have these few exceptions where you are traveling across from Lebanon. Most in the beginning traveled to Hatay province, Antakya, and crossed uh, in this area. Later on, it became uh, uh, further to the, to the east. Uh, but various ways, modern times it's air travel that counts. Uh, so most uh, came to the area uh, by, uh, by plane and then crossed into Istanbul. Few even walked across from Bulgaria, uh, Bulgarian border. The Turks have had various approaches to those arriving. 
And in the beginning, they didn't stop very many. So it was passing through Turkey was not a problem. Restrictions and returning uh, suspected foreign fighters came at a later stage, long or after 2014, actually. The first to travel, they would find their way to the border. They would, especially 2012, 13, they would get to the border and simply climb across the fence when there were no Turkish soldier, soldiers around. And uh, <clears throat> so avoiding the border guards, the Turkish soldiers, they would seek out their group on the Syrian side. In, uh, in Antakya, you could actually go into shops and uh, you could equip yourself with the uniforms of the various militias uh, in 2012-13. You know, they were traveling through uh, and then, okay, I'm going to join this group. Okay, they have this logo, they have this uh, symbol, I'll get that. So, those traveling to the Islamic State, and that's been the majority of those travel in 2014 and later, they are being driven to the border after staying in these safe houses, being driven to the border, and then told to wait. Because in 2014, the Turks started to be more restrictive. So even though the various militias controlled the, the border gates in different areas, you couldn't just drive through the Turkish customs and uh, checkpoints and then arrive uh, in Islamic State territory you would have to find a place outside the border crossing areas and then run across. And that's what they did. On the Syrian side, they would be received by a group of armed men with pickups, minibuses, <clears throat> and then they would be tra transported to holding houses and reception centers. <clears throat> These are the, the areas uh, in the beginning, 2012-13, this area was uh, the, a lot of crossings. Later on, it's this area, uh, not through Jarablus and not through uh, Akchakali, uh, but the borders on, on each side here. So you would wait till it's clear, it could be day or night, and you run across and there would be a truck waiting for you, picking you up and driving you to a safe house. Uh, two uh, Norwegian or from Norway traveling together, they crossed somewhere here, and then they were held uh, for a few days uh, in a small, very small village, and then they ended up in a reception center near Jarablus. Uh, which was uh, a border crossing controlled by the Islamic State uh, in the summer of 2014. It was actually shared with the other opposition's group at that point. Later on, Islamic State had full control. So, again, the first who traveled, they were received by their group, assessed, and registered. The registration had to do with the Islamic practice of notifying families if you are killed. So they needed names, addresses, contacts, relatives uh, back in your home country. Often they also registered the blood type, if you knew it. <laughs> they didn't take samples, but if you knew your blood type, it could be written down for medical purposes if you were wounded. <clears throat> so we can see that several groups, different groups, had similar procedures here. There was also a, some sort of security clearance. But this is where the Islamic State is more thorough than most groups. So those who traveled to the Islamic State from the summer of 2014, they went through several stages of registration, control, and training. And the problem for the Islamic State at this time was that 
became so many, actually thousands per week, that their uh, system of reception broke down. They simply could not handle the numbers that came because ideally they should be wetted through security checks, uh, they should have training, they didn't have enough trainers, etc., etc. So the system was almost falling apart, uh, especially in the summer of 2014, because so many traveled to join the Islamic State, not necessarily to fight in a jihad, but to live in an Islamic State. What usually happened is that the the arrival, uh, upon arrival, they would hand in passports, mobile phones, and other electronic equipment. Sometimes the passports were uh, kept by the Islamic State, actually sent to Raqqa. So if you needed it, you would have to go to Raqqa to pick up your passport from an office there. Uh, phones, mobile phones, cell phones, and other electronic equipment uh, were handed back to you. <clears throat> and also money. Very interesting story. One of, the, one, of the, one of those who traveled from Norway was an old drug addict. And uh, drugs not liked much in the Islamic State. And this guy was trying to get off drugs, so he had a lot of Subutex, which is a sort of drug. He had enough Subutex for half a year. And uh, he had that packed with him. Luggage is, of course, checked by the Islamic State. And I asked him, what happened to the Subutex? No, they gave it back to me. So that was okay. I don't know if they knew what it was. Maybe he just said it's medicine. I don't know. People were registered. You had to sit in front of someone who wrote down necessary information in a form, actually a PowerPoint uh, template were used as a, as a form, an electronic registration form, where uh, background where, uh, and interests were uh, noted down. And we know that these forms were updated as electronic forms they could follow the foreign fighter or Syria traveler along the way. And we know that they were registered because on some computers we have found this form and it was registered on this date. And then we, on another, another computer, researchers and journalists have found the registration form for the same person, but with additional information. So it was a, dyna a dynamic form. And here we have an Islamic State registration form. And uh, when I did my initial research, uh, around 4,000 such forms were found. Now, I think there must be many more and they will be analyzed eventually, maybe released by security services, Americans and so on, uh, for uh, researchers. What they have noted, and this is a Norwegian uh, in this case, uh, did he have a contact person <clears throat> in Syria? Uh, his qualifications are noted, knowledge of Islam, uh, what he would like to do. Uh, I have a Norwegian translation here. This guy was killed, February 2015. Sindre Vaje uh, from Trøndelag, Vardarn. Uh, he called himself Abu Huraira. Uh, and Norwegian. Uh, his mother's name was given, birth date, he was married, his wife is still there in uh, Al Hol or maybe moved to a Roj uh, uh, detention camp now. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, they didn't care much about his education, probably because he didn't have much. Uh, <clears throat> Sharia level, they didn't note, even though he was a convert. Uh, he didn't know much, his work, freelance. Uh, his contact person is only the person who helped him across the border. Uh, <clears throat> this guy in, uh, in, uh, that he uh, met in Jarablus. 
he refers to his uh, wife, his date of arrival in July uh, 2014 is noted. He has not been fighting jihad before. He uh, aims to become a fighter, a warrior. Uh, <clears throat> does he have a speciality? Um, but this is not noted. He handed in passport and telephone. And you can see here, of course, they cannot assess his obedience before he has arrived. So this shows that the form is meant to be updated, including with the date of death. So women and children are sent to women's houses. And we know this because one from Norway, he took his wife and children with him against her wishes. And while he was in training, uh, she had to stay in a woman's, women's house with the children, waiting. And this has been also written about uh, in, in the literature, emphasizing uh, the role, the position of women. Married women would then wait for their husbands to finish training, uh, and then they would be allocated to the, to the house of the husband, or the husband would get an, a house or an apartment uh, where he could live with his family. Unmarried women must wait in the women's house until they have found a husband. Some thought they would come and do, for example, work in a hospital, and they ended up being stuck in these women's houses until uh, a suitable husband had married them. <clears throat> the husband will then be responsible for them, and the husband would be sent to compulsory religious and military training. The ambition of the Islamic State was that all citizens of the state should have military training. It never came, came that far, but the foreign fighters uh, were to have uh, both religious and military training. These two uh, forms of training were separate, varied in length and quality, it started with Islamic training. Religion was the first uh, point on the agenda. So it was religious training emphasizing the Islamic State interpretation of the Sharia. The quality could vary a lot. It usually should be two to three weeks, but also for those who aimed at more thorough knowledge, much longer. There were minor elements of physical exercise and military training within this. But to give an example, the, this guy from Norway who brought his family, he was actually a Syrian. So one could ask, what could argue that he wasn't really a foreign fighter. He came back to Syria to fight. But he spoke Arabic, of course. So his training was in Arabic. And then they went into the works of uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the 18th century uh, theologian, and his book, uh, Kitab al-Tawid, and it was a book they had to study thoroughly. But another example, in the total other end, was a Norwegian convert who traveled, ended up in Shadadi, a small town in the east of Syria, it was controlled by Kazakhs, Kazakhstan. The emir of that uh, town uh, of that town was from Kazakhstan, but there were also a lot of other foreign fighters. And this guy, he was put in, put in a group of Indonesians, and they had their religious training in Indonesian language. Of course, he didn't understand anything, so they told him, "Okay." You can watch these videos. And they gave him an, you know, like a 15 minute update of what had been said in English uh, in the evening, every now and then, not necessarily every day. So he didn't learn anything. And he was probably the guy who needed it most because he had traveled to Syria on impulse. <laughs> he, 
Yeah, uh, it, it's hard to know when he converted, if he converted at all. But <laughs> he was there and he was supposed to have, uh, have this uh, sort of religious training. The military training was also problematic. It should last at least two weeks, up to four weeks, with variations in view of access to instructors and the need for fighters at the front. I have a case where one from Norway volunteered to go further south. He wanted to fight in Homs against the regime, so he volunteered to go on a bus and he thought he would go to Homs. He ended up in Homs province, somewhere in the desert where there was a training camp. And when they arrived in the middle of the night, the guard says, oh, are you coming now? We don't have any trainers for you. So they didn't get any military training. And this guy then suddenly developed a stomach problem and got out. Still convicted for participation in a terrorist organization when he arrived back in Norway. The religious and military training were taking place in different locations. <clears throat> Now, even if all men were given religious and military training in principle, some were probably, especially if you had done military service in your home country, you could be sent to the front directly if they needed people at the front. And if you were a medical doctor, you were probably needed more at the hospital than at religious training. So probably they were not too strict about these, the order of events. Uh, they were also pragmatic. But people could, as you could see from the uh, registration form, you could also tell the Islamic State what they wanted. I want to be, I want to do. So based on qualifications and their own wishes and the Islamic State needs, people were distributed to different tasks, to different uh, jobs. In the bureaucracy, they needed doctors, engineers, drivers, repair people, numerous vocations and jobs to be filled. And there was an ad, if you can call it that, there was a guy, a British guy, who said, well, I know that there are some of you who are not really brave enough, actually you're a bit cowards who don't want to fight in the jihad, but the Islamic State need you anyway. So we need, and then he lists a lot of jobs, including personal trainer probably meant people who could help in physical training of the fighters. But a lot of different jobs to be filled. And we know that they filled them because the Islamic State tried to build a state. Of course, many came to fight. And some also came to volunteer as suicide bombers. They wanted to be martyrs as soon as possible. So there were selection during the different phases of training, arrival. People were asked, do you want to participate in a martyr operation? Some volunteered, some were persuaded later on. The majority of women were housewives or housemakers, homemakers, in accordance with Islamic State ideology. They were meant to raise children as future fighters for the Islamic State. Some might have spread propaganda and done recruiting online. We know of some examples where people were sitting uh, online in Raqqa or other places in Syria or Iraq, but mostly in Syria, and uh, trying to entice people to travel to Syria. We know of a small group of women who were in the morality police, the Hizbah, which had, uh, had women um, divisions. They were allowed to carry weapons and they were also controlling, even harassing other women through abuse, even torture as a punishment for infringement of the morality codes of uh, the Islamic State. Oh, you have not covered well enough. You don't have the right gloves, I can see part of your face. You don't have the right shoes. <clears throat> Who were these women? Both local and foreigners. The foreign women 
where very often, and this was what I thought was interesting when I interviewed the refugees in Turkey this spring, they emphasized again and again that the foreign women they saw in the Hizba, they were the wives of foreign fighters. So foreign fighters with wives who were dedicated to the Islamic State, they volunteered to uh, carry out jobs in the morality police. We have also some reports that towards the end when the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces and the international coalition from the air uh, put pressure on the Islamic State and they were retreating, uh, some women were mobilized to take part in the fight. How many, I don't know if this is well known, maybe uh, intelligence services will release information about this eventually, but uh, this is uh, so far uh, not very well covered as far as I know. So, some left and came home. Why? Many different reasons were given from visiting family, getting married, simply holiday, recreation. Uh, there are also medical reasons. We have more and more example of people who were delus uh, uh, disillusioned and they wanted to defect. And they gave false reasons, especially medical reasons. <clears throat> How did they get out? Because it wasn't, you know, you couldn't just say, oh, no, I don't want this anymore, I'm leaving. Uh, in uh, the fall of 2014, at least 128 defectors were executed by the Islamic State. They did not want deserters. So it wasn't easy, but it was definitely not impossible, uh, even though it could be difficult. Especially in view of the execution of deserters, it was not something that you would say that this is something I would do. It was not impossible if you got permission, then you could travel to the Turkish border and you had the necessary papers from the Islamic State and you would get through from their side and the Turks would uh, often accept you. But you could also travel illegally, of course, some would be assisted by smugglers. Part of the problem here is that the Turks started in 2015 to build a wall. No, 2014, they started to build a wall. So when we're talking about the wall between the United States and Mexico, that is nothing compared to the wall that the Turks have built practically all along the border to Syria. It's three meters high and it's hard to climb, but some did climb it and got across. Others would have helped by smugglers, false papers and get through the checkpoints. Some would be appre apprehended in Turkey, especially those who cross the border outside the crossing points without papers. You could even be fired at. One Norwegian was fired at and actually wounded by Turkish forces. He spent five months in Turkish jail and received a sentence in Turkey before he was, uh, before he was released and sent to Norway. Many have reached their home countries. And some have been arrested and put on trial in their home countries, and some have been convicted. Most been convicted for participation in a terrorist organization and for entering into a terrorist conspiracy. The total numbers of returnees arrested and convicted are unclear and difficult to find. There is a European police cooperation and they had a they had a newsletter or an information sheet that was accessible and where they gave examples of sentencing. And that was to coordinate police efforts, etc. And I found this one and they had a number of, uh, of such reports and then it suddenly stopped. And then it had become restricted. And I asked for access to it because it would be a source of finding out how many in Germany, France, Britain, etc., etc., have been on trial after having returned. And I asked for permission as a researcher to look into this and I was denied access. Uh, probably someone has information 
on a European level, <clears throat> but it is difficult to find. To Norway, the Norwegian Police uh, Security Service estimates the following. Approximately 100 traveled to Syria, including women. Most have joined Jabhat al-Nusra and or the Islamic State, especially since 2012. 14, it's mostly Islamic State. Some have joined groups uh, affiliated or allied with Jabhat al-Nusra, and still they have been considered Jabhat al-Nusra. Well, of these 100, PST, uh, the Police Security Service, estimates that 40 are killed. These are the recent, the most recent estimates that I found this year. 40 have returned to Norway or traveled to another country. 20 are still alive in Syria or Syria, Iraq, including 10 women in detention. <coughs> Most of them are in, det in detention in Kurdish controlled detention camps. Of these, those who have returned, seven or eight have been tried and sentenced in Norway. One woman returned early this year with children, and she is currently in custody and awaiting trial next year, starting March next year. So it's difficult to say what the retinues can expect upon return, because it varies so much. In Norway, more than 30 have not been arrested. Why not? If PST know, if they know that they have been in Syria, why haven't they been charged, put on trial? Very interesting question. Is it lack of evidence? The evidence in the cases so far shows that they have been there. But no one has been charged with any specific act. None of them. You shot against those. You placed a bomb. You took part in that offensive. No, you were in Syria. You were in uh, Islamic State controlled territory. Therefore, you have been a member. And if you're a member, you have also entered into a terrorist conspiracy. So if they know that others have been in Syria in Islamic State controlled areas, why aren't they on trial? And this is important because what they are saying is that all the women upon return will be charged. And what have the women done? Yeah, they will be charged with participation in a terrorist organization. How do they know that they have done something else than the 30 they have not charged? I think this is a worrying arbitrariness in the application of the law. And it really worries me. But those who have committed crimes in Syria should be held accountable. And we have the international discussion. Should there be trials here? Should there be trials there in Syria, in the Kurdish controlled areas? These are important questions and we have no answers yet. Thank you for your attention. So um, I haven't received any questions uh, online, but uh, perhaps if any of, of you have questions, uh, we have some time for that now. Just raise your hand and I'll try to keep track of, of who you are. Let's see, we'll start there. Hi. Um, so in the numbers you did, um, um, the statistics, it's mostly, or like, it's mostly or exclusively Islamic State or like, kind of like the Christian, like the other you have been, uh, you have data. It's like something in, as opposed to say CPK or YCC. No, these are, uh, the yeah. yes, the question was uh, the numbers, travelers, foreign fighters from Norway, have they only joined the Islamic State or are we talking about, uh, for example, Kurdish groups? And the answer is that uh, as far as I know and as far as uh, the uh, security police are giving out information. We're talking about people who have traveled to, uh, to the opposition against the regime and uh, in the main Islamist groups. Uh, so 
the largest number considered having traveled to the Islamic State. But in the beginning, there were also people who went to, and we know this because they have explained so, they went to other groups. Uh, uh, some went to Jabhat al-Nusra. Ah, okay. Then the security police says they are on the UN terrorist, terrorist group list. So therefore, we charge them. If you went to the Free Syrian Army, and some did, not all factions of the Syrian Free Syrian Army would accept foreign fighters, but some did for a period. Uh, then, then, then they were our allies. But the numbers who have done so are very small. So the majority of the hundred are supposed to have joined an Islamist uh, group, extreme Islamist group, Jabhat al-Nusra or Islamist state. Uh, another clarification on the numbers. You said there were 40,000 uh, foreign soldiers in ISIS. Yes. Um, does this, is this mostly from Western countries or is no, no. Russian like, or like uh, Chinese? Uh, the, the, the total number is around 40,000 joining the Islamic State are from all over the world. All over the world. Many from, uh, from former Soviet uh, 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 Muslim majority republics, uh, but in principle from all over the world, south and from America, north and south, etc. etc. A question from uh, Jakob Hegelt. Thanks, so very, it's fascinating. Thanks for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I'm wondering about this uh, how explicit or visible the ideological aspect is. So, you mentioned as one of the reasons for going, this idea of uh, hijra from, from a jahiliya. Mm. So that very sort of evokes uh, you know, particularly Saikut for me. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, this t teaching of uh, the Muhammad Abu Wahab. Uh, so can you say something about how, uh, do you know any more about specific thinkers, ideologues being referred to Mentioned. Do you repeat the question, please? The, uh, the question is, uh, the, the main ideologues, theologians, refer to in the uh, Islamic teaching, the Sharia teaching, uh, upon arrival. And the interesting thing is that uh, those who have been on trial uh, in Norway, they can't say much about it. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying that they are not sincere believers. But their knowledge of Islam is incredibly shallow. And they have picked and chosen before they went uh, online uh, what sort of, uh, of, of um, fatwas they would count as important. And based on that, they would say, yes. For example, we have one discussion between uh, two who are planning to travel. And uh, they are from Östfold, Fredrikstad, and they are uh, discussing. And discussing. And this and has this been secured, secured by, 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 by the police. police. They, they have, they have yeah. chat, chatted yeah. on this. And, yes, yes, well, should, should we travel? travel? Now we can do our duty by collecting humanitarian aid here. Yeah, but we have this one who says that it is an obligation to travel. And then they are using some of these Islamic concepts. You know, it's uh, an individual duty. You have to do it. Yeah, but in another sense, he says this and that. Uh, yeah, but okay, I agree. We, we go. That, that's the level. And as soon as they have settled the question of traveling, what sort of gun do you want? Um, I mean, these are much guys, and <laughs> they're young. So that is much more important, really, than, you know, in depth understanding. Uh, what of, of the theology they are entering into. And uh, so, so it is amazingly shallow, but it doesn't mean that the conviction is less. I mean, you, <laughs> you can have a superficial Christian belief and still that belief could be very strong. So I, I actually have a follow-up question to that. You don't have to repeat it because they can hear me. Um, <laughs> You, you, you showed us a, a registration form earlier where one of the questions that they were asked or assessed on um, was their level of knowledge of the Sharia. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about this, about how you know, the, the understanding of Islam and of the Sharia is very shallow and so on. But, but the fact that that is 
a criterion that they're assessed on when they, when they arrived would suggest that um, that somehow played in, the level of knowledge somehow played in and what role they were given, perhaps they were given a particular position uh, if they were, were very knowledgeable. It, was that the case? And, and what kinds of positions were they given if they happened to know a lot about, about the Sharia? Qadi, they were judges. They became judges. And some of them didn't know anything. I mean, they had more knowledge than many others. But when I say they didn't know anything, it's because they were so young, you know, in their mid twenties, a, a, a proper Qadi training takes years and years, but they were then because they knew more than others. They were appointed Qadis in a village, in a town or in a district. And suddenly you are an old man, local Syrian, and you stand before this 25, 30 year guy who is going to decide the merits of a case according to the Sharia. So it, it meant that, yes, they asked these questions uh, because it was important to fill these roles as judges in the Sharia system that they established. And we also know that the punishments, the punishments they meted they out, out could vary from, from one, one town, town to, the, to another. In one town, smoking, prohibited, okay, a fine, two days in jail. Oh no, here we have lashes and so on, several days in jail, et cetera, et cetera. So because of the Islamic system, there was huge variations, also because of, because of the discretion given to the judge, but also because of the le level of knowledge of the judges. We have a question from uh, Jan Enik. What happened with the Norwegian convert that had to join the Indonesian unit? He, uh, what, what happened to the Norwegian convert who joined over uh, with the Indonesian unit? Well, he was eventually sent to what should have been military training. He was put on a, on a, uh, on a truck. And when they arrived at the camp where he, did, he wasn't told what was going to happen, he was just told to get along. And when he was jumping off the truck, an old back injury made it impossible for him to continue. He had to have uh, medical treatment. So he went back to Shadadi and then he was shuffled around. And in many strange ways, he fell between the cracks because eventually he realized that this was not the right place. So he tried to get out. He's the one who had returned and who has been there the longest. So he traveled around from Shadali to Raqqa, and then he met a guy from, uh, I think it was Estonia, who was also trying to defect. They joined up, they traveled around. They were arrested on several occasions and suspected of defection and sent back to Raqqa, report to this office, the Anwar al-Awlaki battalion, you have to join them, and the Anwar al Awlaki battalion was the battalion allegedly also where the Beatles belonged. Uh, Jihadi John and his British friends, they never met them. And it's very strange, but uh, his story uh, fits and was confirmed by the friend he was traveling along with. He was interrogated in the court via link from his home country where he is arrested. <laughs> So uh, eventually he got out, he climbed the wall, jumped over and was shot at by the Turks and wounded before he came to Norway and he got a seven and a half year sentence. He's currently serving. The question is, have the authorities, the police or, uh, or uh, justice uh, ministry given this? Uh, uh, I think you have to unmute me. Or maybe no, I cannot mute it. I think it's just. Uh, okay. Yeah, OK. Uh, um, no, they have not given any uh, explanation. And I've asked journalists to dig into this. 
because I think it is an important question. Uh, and uh, I have, as far as I, as I know, they haven't asked or haven't been given an answer that they have recorded. But I hope they will continue to ask if they have asked, because this is important. And it is important because if we're talking about serving justice, there should be equal treatment for all in the same position. Especially when they are saying we are going to charge all the women, 10 women, if they are returning, one has returned and is charged, will be on trial, and then you have 30 men, most, where, where it's much more likely that they have carried arms than this woman who has returned has carried arms, and she will be on trial, and uh, if she is sentenced, she will get four years. Four, four and a half years in jail. And then you have, and she has been, and there is no evidence for anything else that she has been a housewife. And then uh, the men who most, where it's much more likely that they have been carrying guns are not charged. So we have one more question here first. Okay. You have to speak. The, what has been the, um, the socio-economic background uh, of these? Uh, we can just focus on Norway, but it's extremely, for most of us, we're strange that we live in this amazing country and you decide to go somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, to fight for a place you don't even know about. So, but what has like have there been uh, mostly ex-convicts? You mentioned one that was a drug addict. Have we seen this type of maybe outcasts? Yes, society? social, economic, educational background of those who have traveled. Uh, probably it varies from country to country, but from Norway, most have been dropouts from, from school. They did not uh, finish high school. They were, all of them were unemployed when they left. Uh, they have had what the, the security police says in their analysis, a weak connection to the labor market. It's a way of saying that they have not really been working very much. Uh, and we find, we find the same pattern in, uh, in other countries. Uh, there are some differences when it comes to level of education. I think Britain has sent more, or there has been more from Britain with higher education than from Germany or France. Uh, so, of course, there are, there are variations. I mean, there are doctors, engineers, etc. who travel, but very many uh, are in the lower uh, end of the social scales when it comes to education, uh, earning, etc. That's, that's a very rough answer. So, we have two more. Uh, you first. So I know the Dutch setting is a bit better, but I know that like this is just maybe my reading of it. But I know in the Netherlands there's also like much more controversy about the women than there is about the man returning. And I was wondering, like, so I wonder what you think of this assumption because I feel that in the Netherlands there's much more concern about the children and how they sort of might like have being part of a very traumatic experience so that the Dutch state sort of feels like we don't want to burn our hands to the children. So I wonder to what extent like that sort of picking out the women might actually also mean communicate because the children tend to accompany the women. Um, so that is a bit my reading of that situation and then I wonder if you think that would apply for Yes, the, the question is about uh, the women and children. Uh, should they be treated together or, uh, or separately? In, uh, in the Netherlands, um, there is a focus on uh, both women and children and how to treat them. And we've had the same discussion in Norway. Norway has said, okay, we take the children, but we don't take the responsible mothers. 
and uh, the mothers don't want to give up their children, so they are there. And we're talking about maybe 30 children, Norwegian children, with their mothers. Some had children when they left, took them with them, and others have given birth to one or two or three children uh, while in, uh, in city. That's why we have this number of maybe 30 children. That's also a uh, security police estimate. Um, and uh, some are saying, well, we cannot take back the children because they are potential terrorists. They will grow up and they will, uh, uh, they will be a danger. And the fact is that they would be much more of a danger if they grow up in a holding camp in, uh, in Syria. Because they have a right to return and they will return one day. And if they have been then uh, the wretched of the earth traveling around in the Middle East, scuffling around, they are going to have much more of an extremist mind than if they were brought home now and raised in Norway. It's an obvious conclusion. And it is sheer stupidity and political stupidity not to realize this and bring the children home. Even if you bring the mothers home, then uh, you have to uh, put the, the women on trial and uh, sentence them. Uh, but to leave the children there is to ask for a disaster in the future. Um, yes. Thank you very much for your talk, first of all. You mentioned that uh, approximately 40 people have returned to Norway. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the motivations of uh, these returned needs and in what times that they returned. Was it more early on because of disillusionment with what is in Stuttgart? Or did the majority return later on, uh, also being afraid of what was happening to the Islamic State and its decline? The question is uh, about the returnees that have not been uh, on trial. Uh, when did they return and what were their reasons for their uh, return? And uh, my answer is that I don't know. Uh, some, of course, came back pretty early. They went in 2012. They were there for a few months. Uh, they thought they had done what they should do and they came back home. And uh, According to information, uh, those who left in 2012 um, and early 13 and came back after a relatively short period, the security police says, well, we have decided for some reason not to prosecute, not to put them on trial. I, I don't understand why. They haven't said why not, but this is what a journalist has received as an answer. Simply that we don't do that. How many they are? If it is 20 of the 40, or if it is, uh, that has returned, or I don't know. Uh, but uh, since 2015, not many have traveled. Uh, so it was a period between 2012 and 2015 uh, that the traveling went on, then it became more and more difficult. The Turks clamped down uh, cooperation between European countries uh, security services all over the world managed to stop the flow of foreign fighters. So it was both the fact that the Islamic State did not succeed, it started to decline very soon. I mean, the bombing, the Allied bombing started in September, August, September 2014, and from then on they were pushed back until 2017. So of course, when it's a success, as it was in the summer of 2014, then people want to go, and then it's not so interesting to join the losing team. Uh, and then people started to defect, uh, and more and more this guy who jumped the ball. Uh, it took him a long time, but he came out in 2000. Uh, he, he went in December 2014, and he came back in, it was there 15 months, so he came back early in 2007, uh, 2016. So, and then he had tried to defect for quite some time, which was considered uh, when he was sentenced. He, he was a member, but then he tried to defect from summer of 2015. So his membership was uh, for this limited period since he tried to get out. And uh, we, we have no reason, the judge says, to not believe 
uh, his story on this uh, his story on this point. So, but but the problem is that we don't. I, I don't know who these people are. They have returned. Where are they? Are the security police keeping them under surveillance? Are they registered as a potential threat in the future? What is going on here? I don't know. And nobody else that I've talked to know or will tell me what's going on, which I find disturbing. So we have one final question here. Yes. Um, you mentioned a little bit about their understanding of religion. Um, but I'm curious, because you talked to some people when they returned, right? I was wondering uh, about the term uh, Islamic and Muslim. Mm. And like, you know, we usually say, uh, Islamist is and Muslims, and just the difference there uh, intrigues me. And I'm curious, did any of the returnees have any reflection on religion? Like, did they see their understanding of Islam in a bigger picture? And did they ever, was there some kind of acknowledgement that I understood, uh, I understood Islam in a very specific way and in other people's opinion maybe a wrong way? It's a very interesting question about how these travelers understood uh, religion, if it developed while they were there, if it changed while they were there, if they differentiated uh, between uh, different uh, Islamic positions. And it's hard to say. What, what is a general, general picture, and I think this it bears out with the experience of other countries, is that many of these saw themselves as non-practicing Muslims, and then they have gone through a conversion process, becoming practicing Muslims. They are not saying, oh no, I am, you know, I'm this or that. They are simply saying that I am now a practicing Muslim. Then they ignore the great span in interpretations within Islam, because they have found their way of understanding it. And they say that, well, this is, this is the right way. And it's, it's interesting, in 2013, we have a conversation, <clears throat> because some of these guys who traveled in 2012-13, they end up on different sides, because Jabhat al-Nusra and Islamic State start to quarrel in 2013. And they are literally on each side and some of them are sending back questions to Norway to Prophet Uma, asking what group is right here which group is on Huck which has the truth you know and the guy the spokesperson for Prophet Zuma he has to say I don't know I have to check it I have to talk to someone knowledgeable in England you know so they were confused, but one of these guys who was on trial, and, and this shows some, to some extent, their, their understanding of Islam. What sort of Islam? Because he says that he defected. And the reason he defected, he said in the first quote, he said, I will only tell the judges this if the doors are closed, because this is so special. And uh, the judge did not accept to close the doors for his uh, testimony. So he was sentenced, and he, he was not believed when he said that something had happened that shook his faith. And then he came to the appellate court, what about him, Lord Monsret? And he was asked again, of course, he said that something shook my conviction. Yeah, what, what, what was it? Should we believe you? Was it really a good reason for defecting that you turned your back to the Islamic State? And he said, I will tell you if the doors are closed. And then he looked around and I was the only one sitting there. <laughs> and he said, that's okay. So I can tell the court. And what he said, he was, in Manuj, town in Syria, where his group was placed. And his friends were going to Kobani 
to fight. And one day he was out and he was using a motorbike. And suddenly a pickup truck comes by. And on the flight of the pickup was a load full of bodies. And they were singing. And he was shocked. Because he really thought that those, his friends, who had been martyred, would never rot. Because a martyr will not rot. The body of a martyr will not rot. And it would smell of musk. So he was really shocked. And I thought, can you be that naive? Is it possible to be that naive? If you're killed and you're, because you say you're a martyr? So I checked around. And I talked to an Islamist. Here in, in Norway, is it rubbish. Of course, the corpses, even on the Shaheed, will rot. The Prophet is dust. He disappeared. So this is, this is an excuse. He's making it up. So I called my wife in Palestine. She's teaching students at Beelzeit University. 18-year-old students in two different classes. And I asked her, can you check what Palestinian students believe about martyrs? And they have enough of them in Palestine. So we should check. 40% of the students believe that the bodies of a martyr will never rot. His belief was not a stupid, you know, belief. It was really what he thought. And that's why he was shocked. And he felt betrayed by those who had told him that if he died, he would not rot. So the imam he was conferring with said, don't talk about this. But then it was accepted that he should go back, he should go back to Norway for some, some reason. And he came, he came back, back to Norway. Norway. The security police didn't know that he had returned until they discovered him by accident. Then he was arrested and he served eight years for his mistaken beliefs in martyrdom. Okay, okay, we are perhaps a bit over time, I don't know. So I can I'm, continue, but uh, there are mighty tired people on the other end of the cameras here. Yeah, I think, I think we'll end on that light note. And uh, <laughs> I'll just uh, thank everyone for coming and thank everyone for logging on. Um, I'll also just mention that we have, a, we have another lecture next Friday. Uh, that one will not be here physically. That will all be on, on Zoom. Uh, that is uh, Ulrika Mortensen, who will be zooming in from NTNU in Tromsø to oh, talk hi. about uh, human rights in early and medieval Islam, the case of Al-Tabari's Madhab Jadidi. Uh, okay, so that's, that'll be on Zoom. I'll be sending out info on that pretty soon. And, and thank you very much to uh, Dr. Lars Gule for coming here. Uh, and thank you again for all the great questions. Thank you.